Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah, chapter 58, starting at verse 3. Why have we fasted, and ye see it not? Why have we humbled ourselves, and ye take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast ye seek your own pleasure, and oppress all your workers. Behold, you fast only to quarrel, and to fight, and to hit with a wicked sword. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover him, but not to hide yourself from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go forth, shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer, and you shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. This is the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us. And the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. For nothing can come to his praise. Our epistle reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. For we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person, which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory be to thee. Jesus said, 
you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass away from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hear these words of Jesus You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Dear friends in Christ, the texts that we have before us today, if we're not careful, they can be really, really uncomfortable texts for us to hear. I mean, did you hear the final verse of our gospel lesson this morning? It was almost difficult for me to follow up by saying, this is the gospel of our Lord. This is the good news of Jesus. Because in that final verse, Jesus tells his disciples, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and of the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And you've got to remember that the scribes and the Pharisees They were the ones whose business it was to make sure that they don't step a toe out of line in terms of the law. They were the ones who would put so many barricades between them and the Ten Commandments that they would never even get close to breaking one of them. They were the ones who, so that they wouldn't accidentally work on the Sabbath day, they had rules and regulations about how far a distance you could walk on the Sabbath day, about what was considered work on the Sabbath day, about what was considered rest. These were the ones who were experts at keeping the law. And Jesus says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, this is the gospel of our Lord. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Previous to that, Jesus says everyone who relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus really lays it out and he says, you know, if you you introduce gray areas to the black and the white of God's law, his do this and you shall not do that, well, then least in the kingdom of heaven. Previous to that, Jesus says... If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. Well, well maybe, you, maybe you're starting to get the point that I'm trying to make here is that sometimes even in our gospel, sometimes we hear the law. Sometimes God's word, it, it takes us and, well, it does what God's Word does because that's the way that the Spirit of God works. But sometimes he'll take a word and he'll, he'll de-emphasize you are the salt of the earth, which means you are useful, you are beneficial, you are good. Sometimes he'll take words like you are the light of the world. 
He'll take those and he'll maybe turn down the light just a little bit as we hear them, as we receive them in our hearts. And he'll really amplify. He'll really turn up if your righteousness doesn't exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the way that sometimes God's word hits me. I know it does the same thing to you. When we read through God's word, and when we see what God expects of us, well, sometimes it feels like we just can't measure up. For instance, in our Old Testament lesson today, it, there's all this talk of fasting. And as someone who, um, it wasn't a resolution, but during the month of January, I ate extra healthy. And um, I'm not going to say it was torture, but it wasn't a lot of fun. And saying no thank you to uh, birthday cakes and to, uh, to uh, well, an alcoholic beverage or two, to junk food and candy and cookies and everything else for 30 long days, well, I feel like I've, I've really been through it. But if you look at our Old Testament lesson, it's all about fasting. Although I don't think they're talking about weight loss here or healthier eating. In fact, you know, we in the Lutheran Church, we do talk about fasting. I can only think of one time that it really comes up. It's in our small catechism when we talk about receiving the sacrament of the altar worthily. Question is, who receives this sacrament worthily? Well, fasting and bodily preparation, Martin Luther writes, are certainly fine outward training. But that person is truly worthy and well prepared who has faith in these words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. But anyone who's, who does not believe these words or doubts them is unworthy or unprepared for the words for you require all hearts to believe. Now, Luther didn't have to bring in this little sentence about fasting and bodily preparation being certainly good outward training, but he did. And I think that he did, and it's, 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 a, it's for a helpful reason. That is to say, how do we prepare our hearts to come to church? In the insert in your bulletins today, God's Word for the Week, there's a wonderful little uh, section uh, in the view, for the pew, view from the Pew uh, that talks about the way that we used to do communion at Holy Cross. I'm talking about back in the olden days. You know, when you would have men sitting on one side of the church and women sitting on the other side of the church, when you would have those who were catechized and those who were communicant members, they would come and then the others would come. They would come afterwards and if they were staying for the whole service, well, they would stay for that part. Uh, there's some interesting details in that. But the question about fasting brings us to that question of how do we come to church? Do we do anything special on Sunday mornings? I know we at least try to encourage our kids to run a brush through their hair. It's a good thing that we come to church with the right attitude, with the right heart. It's a good thing that we have perhaps outwardly prepared ourselves. Maybe we're wearing nicer clothes. Maybe we uh, took a shower this morning to get ready and to make sure that we didn't have any kind of, you know, uh, those eye crusties that you get sometimes and everything else. When we come to the house of God, it's important that we come not only right on the outside, because the Pharisees and the scribes would have done that, but it matters that we come the right way on the inside. It matters that we come in a way understanding that if the bar is set at the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, well, then we will never we will never cross that bar. We will never make it over the top of it. And so we throw ourselves at the mercy of Christ. We say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. We say, oh, almighty God, we confess our sins. I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess that I've sinned against you. We confess our sins so that God might return his word to us once more that says your sins, they are forgiven. I'm going to talk just a little bit more about the fasting that's going on in Isaiah chapter 58. Because it seems like they are offering up a complaint against God. Why have we fasted, O God, and, and you don't see it? Why have we humbled ourselves? We've brought ourselves low, and you don't even acknowledge it. Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure, Isaiah responds, and you oppress all your
talks about true repentance, he talks about true fasting. Is not this the fast that I choose for you, says the Lord? To loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him up and not to hide yourself from your own flesh? This is what fasting actually looks like. This is what is actually good for our bodies, good for our souls. And this is what Jesus means when he says that you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And what does the light do in the world? Well, it shines. Because if we walk through this world without light, we trip, we fall, we stumble over everything. If you live life apart from salt, it's not good. I know in our day and in our culture and in our age, we have too much salt, but that's another issue for another day. Salt is good because it provides flavor. Salt is good because it is the way in the ancient world, at least, that you would preserve things. Salt is useful. Our bodies have to have it. And the world requires it. But again, that little word of Jesus, if salt has lost its saltiness, How will it become salty again? That word creeps in. How do we avoid that temptation, that pitfall? Well, dear friends, it's the same way that we walked into church this way, this morning. It's the same way that we come into church each and every day. As we we walk in confessing our sins, we walk in acknowledging that, yes, our righteousness has not exceeded that of the scribes and the Pharisees. But there is one whose righteousness far exceeds that of the scribes, that of the Pharisees. There is one who did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. He came to uh, take uh, note of every single iota, that's the smallest little letter in the Greek language, and every little jot, that is the smallest little sign that is made in the Hebrew language. He came from start to to finish, to fulfill everything written in the law and in the prophets, and he did so for you. In your place, Jesus came, and he fulfilled the righteous expectation of God. He fasted properly. We're going to hear about this in just a couple of short weeks when we hear about Jesus and his fasting, his his temptation in the wilderness for 40 days. As Jesus was tempted but not beyond his measure. Jesus was tempted, and yet he did not give in to it. Yes, Jesus fasted because he knew that we won't fast. Sure, we may fast on the outside. I knew someone one time that uh, used to tell me, he was a pastor, and he said, I do not eat breakfast on Sunday mornings. I said, well, that's... Is that because of, you know, the fasting and bodily preparation or certainly fine outward training? He said, no, it's because I get upset to my stomach when I have to stand up in front of 200 people and I've got food on my stomach. I said, I probably will never tell that story in that way, but here I go. Nevertheless, whether or not you eat or whether or not you drink to the Lord, you do all things to the Lord. The point here isn't about how we prepare ourselves on the outward level. The point here is that Jesus knew that even if we fasted outwardly, our hearts probably wouldn't be in it. Or we would become proud of the fact that, oh, I fasted, uh, whatever, three times a week. I fasted each and every morning. I, I began my mornings giving them to the Lord and everything else. We either have the pitfall on the one side of pride or the pitfall on the other side of failure and despair, and Jesus knows it. So he came to live that perfect life, to fulfill the law and all of its righteousness, so that today I get to preach Christ crucified. Today I get to tell you about the one who came and he lived his life perfectly, and even so, he gave up that life for you, for me. He laid down that life willingly as he went to the cross, and then he took it up again on Easter Sunday. So that just like Paul, just like all the other pastors and preachers in Christ, I get to preach Christ crucified. Because when you are insufficient, when your righteousness is is found lacking... 
Know that your own righteousness, it doesn't count for anything. Jesus' righteousness is yours. It is a gift given, distributed to you freely. It's washed over you in baptism. It is put onto your own lips and onto your tongue at the sacrament of the altar as we step forward worthy. Worthy to receive the body and blood of Christ. Dear friends, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus has said so, and he means it. So now, as we prepare to get up and leave this place, I would advise you, I would recommend, I would ask you, I would plead of you. Look back over our hymn of the day. Rise and shine, you people. Christ the Lord has entered our human story. God in him is centered. He comes to us by death and sin surrounded with grace unbounded. So what it says there is get up and shine because you're the light of the world. Continues on. See how he sends the powers of evil reeling like darkness going to hide when the lights come on. He brings us freedom, light, life, and healing. All men and women who by guilt are driven, you are now forgiven. Come celebrate your banners high unfurling, your songs and prayers against the darkness hurling. To all the world go out and tell the story of Jesus' glory. Yes, that is our life. Here celebrating and there witnessing. Finally, tell how the Father sent His Son to save us. Tell of the Son who life and freedom gave us. Tell how the Spirit calls from every nation His new creation. Dear friends in Christ, that's you, that's me. And it's also our neighbors. It's those people that are outside of this room that need to hear this stuff. Rise and shine, you people. You have been sent to be a light in the darkness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.